Hello. The footage I'm about to show you is of a man I don't recognise. He's a 50-something Caucasian disc jockey from the Norfolk area, and he's a man so out of touch with ordinary people that he's able to make comments as crass and offensive as these. His name, I'm afraid to say, is Alan Partridge. I was interviewing some teenagers and was very much on their level. That was Funky Gibbon by the goodies to show that we are not averse to a little bit of anarchy. But when one of them accused me of bestial filth... <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? That you shag sheep. I literally went berserk. You, you dick, calling me a sheep shagger. <laughs> I think maybe you're a sheep shagger. Yeah, you almost keeps going. Probably keep sheep magazines <laughs> under your back. Spooning them with your hot balls pushed up against its woolly back. You're just a bloody chav, 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 chav. Watching that footage back, it makes me feel pretty crummy. I vowed never to make the same mistake again. And yet, in an incident that beggars belief, I made a similar mistake the following night at a golf club dinner. Um, I was actually chatting with five chaps. Chaps? So, sorry, I was chatting with five chaps. Five not, chaps? Not five chaps. <laughs> you come here to get away from the chaps. <laughs> Off, back to your council houses. Council houses, council houses, council houses, council houses. I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> There's a shitstorm coming my way. In the days that followed, the footage went viral. And while I hope the person who leaked it also goes viral, I'm talking about Ebola, the public response was damning. I was labelled ignorant, prejudiced, hateful, and in a comment that chilled me to the bone, a man who said he'd secretly filmed me taking my trunks off at the David Lloyd Leisure Centre threatened to use it as revenge porn. I found myself upbraided by management, listeners, and a North Norfolk digital producer who doesn't even work on my show. And then my sponsors began to walk. Chaucer's Country Kitchen, gone. NPP Escrow, gone. United Farm and Animal Feed, wanted to reduce fee. It was the lowest point of my career. But was I to blame, or society? Because it seems to me that in this once united kingdom, a schism has formed. A schism or a chasm between the haves and the have-nots, or haven'ts. And that realisation has given me the idea for a uniquely insightful documentary format. A journey of redemption to the wrong side of the tracks. Join me as I explore an unreported Britain, inhabited by the very people I had offended and, God willing, become a better citizen, a better man, and a better, more sought-after broadcaster. Now, welcome to Alan Partridge's Scissor Dial. Good morning. It's 8 a.m., and I'm about to spend a week with people from a very different background from myself. As you can see, I live in pretty salubrious digs. And while the mortgage crippled me, my name is on the deed. I live here. It's my house. Anyway, this is the la life I'll be leaving behind. See ya! So that's the life I'm leaving behind. But where am I headed? Well, for the next seven days, I'll be living in one of Britain's most deprived areas, the spiritual home of the needy, Manchester. You only need to hear the locals speak to realise that this is an area severely handicapped by poverty. Once a thriving industrial hub, it's today better known for its teeming gay and lesbian scene and, coincidence or otherwise, the recent arrival of the BBC in Salford. Fortunately, I'm accompanied on this journey by my best friend, a chum with real pedigree. Seldom a pedigree chum, although he only eats boiled eggs. Slightly apprehensive about the week ahead. Had a bit of an up and down night. Uh, probably just nerves. Have my usual anxiety dream. Stuck in a lift with Diane Abbott. Stay right. I am. <laughs> From the dawn of the Industrial Revolution to sometime in the late 1970s, Britain was the workshop of the world. The people of Manchester, employed in cushy jobs, mills and factories, where there was work for mum, dad and even the kids. Back to work! It must have seemed like the good times would never end. But then, China happened.
Nowadays, the boys from Beijing manufacture everything from knockoff pistols to dildos, and that's hit Britain hard. So when the UK's manufacturing sector collapsed like a warm Easter egg, where did all the workers go? Well, today, over a million of them are employed in one of these. It's called a supermarket. It's much more than a place to buy cheese, chops, chocks and cheap chicken and chicory and chives. Hello, Alan Partridge, you must be Paul. Uh, it's, it's David. Right. This was store manager really David Paul. Place. It really is like an enormous cathedral, isn't it? Where, where, people, where people come to worship shampoo and grapes. That's fine, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you don't own the store, do you? Uh, no, I'm the manager. The manager, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love the hot flush from the uh, warm air curtain on entry. David had agreed to let me do a shift in store to experience firsthand what it was like to work on the front line of modern retail. You checked your eggs. Yeah, just a bit of chicken shit, but we all follow through now and again, don't we? Men may take all the top jobs in driving and science, but across the UK, women dominate nearly all forms of till-based employment. But could I, as a man, pass muster or scan mustard? And my wife left me for a fitness instructor. Morning. Morning. Do you want to pop your things on the uh, conveyor? Don't worry about that, we're just making a documentary. Want you pop your things on the conveyor belt? No, not the basket, just the items. Oh, well, don't, don't put them on the floor, because you have to keep bending down to pick them up. So just, just pop them back at the end. That's all right. Yeah, but not on the conveyor at the very end. OK. Should we scan your items? OK. Yeah, well, no, don't bring them to me. Um, I, I, I move them forward like this. And put, so just so put the beans back. No, not in the basket. Not in the basket. No, don't bring them to me. Just put them on the conveyor. No, back at the end. No, not in the basket. Put the beans down on the conveyor belt. Now, get off. No, down, leave the beans alone. Not in the basket, on the conveyor belt. Alan. She's not listening to me. What are you doing? But as my shift on the tills wore on, I realised something extraordinary. I was absolutely brilliant at scanning. The female side of my brain, long dormant, had somehow been re-triggered. Some said I was scanning even quicker than Tesco lifer Pat Bevin. Pat could barely conceal her rage. It's 24.40, please, love. Take your time. Take your time. Have a very relaxing weekend. You've got some nice ingredients there. You go careful there now, my love. You all right packing? Shall By entering a form of hyper-concentration, I'd achieved the holy grail of being able to chat and scan an almost zen-like state that would give the Dalai Lama a run for its money. You're right, packing. They call them bags for life, don't they? But uh, I must have two dozen of them in the boots of the car. Looking for self-raising flour? Al four, Chuck. They should call them bags for the drive home. Al, price on Tetley's pack of 40. Every time I get to the uh, checkout, I'm like, ah, oh, where's me uh, where's me bags for life? I heard you were always going out with an old bag. Chance would be a fine thing. What aisle was the flour? Aisle four. 119 for the Tetley. Thanks, Al. That's 16.90. You go careful there now, my love. You're right, packing. These ladies enter this state each and every day, displaying the kind of physical and mental dexterity we normally associate with fighter pilots. Check out, women. The people of Britain salute you. Well, after some initial doubts, I'm impressed with the working conditions here. The store itself is clean and well ventilated, and there seems little chance of workers succumbing to the kind of chronic lung conditions that blighted the mining communities and made their snot black. All in all, Tesco's are just better than local shops. But there was one employee who really stuck with me. There was a quiet dignity to this man. Without him, the entire car park would look like a drained canal. And watching him work over the gentle plank of his giant trolley train made me wonder, who was he? Where was he from? What were his dreams? What were his fears? What was his name? Of course, I'd never know. All right. Go round. Stupid woman. I later found out his name was Carl, because there are hundreds of Carls, not just in supermarkets, but quick fits, HSS tool hires, Greggs. Carls are the backbone of Britain. Carls won us the war. Carls keep us safe, clothed, tool hired, Greggsed. Carls. 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 Alan Partridge says that I'll. 
he's in a bit of a mood because um, I've got four pepper armies in the glove box and um, he, he knows. While well, Seldom's mind turned to the peppery meat rods he craved, mine sorry, turned to the man I'd met seldom, called Carl. Seldom. Sorry, I'm sorry. Well, we all owe a debt to the Carls of this world. All too often, the Carls are a debt to someone else, payday lenders. And for those mad in debt, life can feel an awful lot like this. For the next leg of my journey, I've come down to the town of Cheadle to meet a woman who is being circled by loan sharks. Barely afloat on a lilo of debt, it was only a matter of time before one of them used his teeth to pop it. She's agreed to talk to me on condition of anonymity, fearing that being on camera would lead to reprisals from one of the sharks. In this report, her name has been changed. Shakira, your life has been clattered by debt. Tell us your story. Shakira's voice has been modified for her own safety. I took out the loan to tide me over when I were a bit short. Just temporary, like, to cover bills. Right, so this was essential expenditure. It wasn't as if you were, uh, for want of a better word, spaffing the money on new skirts or shoes. Are you having a laugh? No way. Well, as soon as I fell behind on the payments, I was screwed. Do you know what I mean? It just shows it can affect anyone. I mean, I work. It's not like I'm on the okay. dole or anything. How do you feel? I mean, because it's just a money thing, isn't it? It's just a money thing. If you could solve that. Yeah, I know. I feel like it's the only thing holding me back. Yeah, I think you would soar like an osprey. I think so. I can tell by the expression on your face, which I'm fortunate enough to... Uh, do you know the phrase, a uh, face doesn't lie? No. That's quite a new one. Do, so how do you feel now about payday lenders? I think they're scum. Yeah. I think they're worse than scum. I think they're... I want to say sludge. It galls me to think I'm going to have to smudge out that young lady's face. In fact, I can honestly say that hearing her story has made me more angry than at any time since the 9-11 debacle. That's why I've come here, to confront the man who owns the company that has shat all over her life. Unlike so many of history's most famous moneylenders, from Shylock to those guys in the temple when Jesus went bananas, this one also turned out to be a man. Kevin Ruddock, founder of First Person Finance. First Person Finance declined our request for an interview, so I've come here to Mr Ruddock's comfortable pebble-dashed suburban home, so you can get some answers. Kevin Ruddock, First Person Finance. What is this? Alan Partridge, Power 2 Productions. Do you think it's right that you charge your customers extortionate rates of interest? Why do you charge your customers extortionate rates of interest, Kevin? Why are you walking away, Kevin? I'm sure your customers would like to know where you're walking away. I'm sure your customers would like to know where you're walking past these trees, sort of looking over there for no reason. Hmm? Why, why, do you, why do you charge extortionate rates of interest? It's a simple question, Kevin. You can answer a simple question. You're a big boy, you eat your greens. Hey, you, 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 you tie your own shoelaces, don't you, Kevin? Hey, you eat your crusts. Answer the question. You wipe your own bum. You've always been flat-footed, Kevin. It's not like you're slapping the pavement with two pieces of ham. You stink of toothpaste, by the way. Have you just brushed your teeth? You've got a clean mouth, why don't you use it? Why do you charge your customers extortionate rates of interest? What, eh, hey, Kevin? Why are your cheeks so big? Get off my car. Is that where you store your money? Eh? Are you a coin squirrel, Kevin? Why, why, why do you look like a, a sad teddy? Why do you look like a sad teddy in a suit? Not very good at this, are you? What? I think you should just stick to radio. What do you have? When have you heard my radio show? I listen to it every morning, mate. So they're on in the Norfolk area. I've got a DAB. Right. All right, then what's your favourite bloody bit then? Lunchtime Lunatics. Yeah, that's mine. It's my idea. <sighs> look. Uh, Kev, in. Just go easy on your rates of interest, OK? OK. You know, I get it, you've got a business to run. Man. Bills to pay, customers to keep happy. Um, yeah, I'm the same, I run a business, so... I understand the, uh, the, the, the pressures, but, you know... If you can, go easy on your rates of interest, if you can. I'll take a look at it. Cheers.
I was now two days into my journey of redemption, and Selden was taking me on a long country walk. One of his little eccentricities is that if you look him in the eye, he'll attack you. And as I stopped to explain this to a leggy stranger, something dawned on me. Selden wasn't the only thing I was avoiding eye contact with. I've left the grim desperation of Manchester and headed here to Holgarth Hall in the little-known county of Lancashire to sample the fragrant musk of old money. For I had realised something. How could I ever hope to understand the lives of the have-nots if I didn't first understand the lives of the haves? Or should I say, haven'ts? Built in centuries gone by, even before Hitler was a little baby, it's the kind of home which would make Julian Fellows cream himself. Holgarth Hall. Oh, it really is a magical realm. Oh, half expect a wood nymph or a fawn to appear. Oh, uh, baby deer. No, 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 I, uh, the, the mythical creature. It's uh, mind and face of a man uh, grafted to the limbs of a goat. Well, it sounds awful, but apparently it's Narnian, so... Well, next time I'm in a wardrobe, I'll ask the Lion and the Witch if they've seen one. <laughs> That's brilliant. Quite brilliant. Um, but you remind me of a, a super-rich guy I'm quite friendly with. I don't mean he's super-rich. I mean, he's just a, a super-rich guy. But then a lot of them are. Now, you're a member of the Countryside Alliance, aren't you? Indeed, I am. Yeah, me too. Um, I don't have my membership on me, but I stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, our countryside cousins, or brothers. Although, you know, in remote areas, are often the same thing, and that's the tragedy. Do you think that sort of thing still goes on? No. Now, let's talk about poverty, because a lot of people, petty people, bitter people, people who vote for the red team, say that poverty is the fault of the wealthy. Now, thick or not, that must rankle. Although I, I can understand it. You know, I can't pretend that I haven't been given certain advantages. Almost everything that you can see now, I inherited from my father. I once inherited a clock. Beats buying them. But with those advantages come certain responsibilities. Mm. The, the concept of noblesse oblige. Yeah, oui, magnifique. I knew exactly what he meant. Like James, I'm not short of a bob or two, and I feel I have a duty to use my wealth and status to help people less fortunate such as emceeing an annual charity gala for violent children, sponsored by Tailors of Harrogate. Just found a Maltese in my waistcoat pocket. Weird. I hired this. Beautiful uh, embroidery. Yeah. This chap up here, um bears a striking resemblance to how I imagine the father of Brian May would look. She's gorgeous. Yeah, that is uh, Lord Sebastian. Yeah, no, he's... Um, he's still pretty. Thank you for this time together. Of course, you don't own a house like this. You're a custodian. What a good attitude. Which is why the house is open to the public. Mm. I'm amazed you do that. Well, of course, there are certain subsidies. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, trouser it, mate. Mm. And you, you can't let them run amok. Mm. Equally, we have 50 staff here who rely on the estate for their livelihood, and I'm a, a great believer in rewarding hard work. Mm, but you can incentivise people, I think, too much. And before you know it, you've got a live wire on your hands who's, you know, suggesting the workers get organised. Give me a break. Well, no, we, we like them lively. Yeah, but do, do keep an eye on it, Lord, Lord James. I once had a gardener and a cleaner who came on the same day, and I saw them talking one afternoon, and I thought, hmm. Uh, so I, I, just, I just gently eased them into a staggered arrangement. Would you like to see the estate? Oh, God, yeah. What would you like to see? Oh, um, orangery in the herb garden, please. Well, come this way. <clears throat> I must thank you again for making me feel so at home. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, that you've got this big house and yet people give you money? Please don't touch that. No, God, I, I, I never touch doors in stately homes, even to open them. I'll just stand and wait. Before I left, there was just time for Seldom and I to explore the estate. Oh. Good dog. 
Come here. Well, watching that uh, shepherd corral his sheep into the pen put me in mind of another chap I met earlier who wrangled a different kind of flock, one made of metal and wheels. His name was Carl. For what is a trolleyman but a shepherd of the town? Could it be that despite our vastly different backgrounds, we aren't so very different after all, and that what binds us together is so much stronger than what sets us apart? Right, he's through the fence. Tell them! Tell them! Tell them! Oh, fuck, he's got one! Oh, you have to let him eat it. Alan Partridge says that I'll... The next day, I headed back to Manchester. I wanted to make contact with another unreported group. Oh, you dirty bastard. A demographic pandered to, but forever claiming victimhood, like young mums in a coffee shop. My eyes water. I'm talking about youths. Acidic. But these are no ordinary youths keen on Duke of Edinburgh awards and family barbecues. These are gnarled inner-city youths, lawless men and women who make up Britain's street gangs, and I want to speak with them. Yet arranging a hookup wasn't going to be easy. They're notoriously flighty and deeply suspicious of outsiders. From my operations nerve centre ten feet below street level, I fire off calls, texts, emails and snapcats trying to find a gang prepared to talk. But I come up against dead ends, cold leads and rude idiots. Eventually, through an intermediary, I made contact with a gang from inner Manchester and, with a little persuasion, they agreed to meet. It's 7 p.m. I'm wearing a stab vest and I've just spotted the gang. So here goes. Guys! A gesture of goodwill. It's uh, some uh, 200 cigarettes, unused, mainly Marlborough, uh, a couple of dozen Mayfair, some Lambert and Butler, and uh, 10 chocolate cigarettes because I believe one of you is under 16. The sheep them cigs coming, you know. They're Don't worry, you'll get more than that. You see, I'll, get, uh, I'll get you cigs and uh, I'll, I'll get you booze. Giving them that big bag of fags had bought me some time, but I was still wary. Life is cheap on the sink estates of Manchester, and with a rap sheet that included bicycle theft, fighting, loud ball sports, and back chat to constables, this wasn't a crew no. to be messed was with. A film a few years ago with uh, Kevin Costner. One wrong move from me, and things could turn seriously ugly. He's a pretty respected actor. They agreed to let me hang out with them, and after strolling up and down this road so we could film them walking in slow motion, the group splintered. Gavin went to buy oven chips. Was McCain a nod to cocaine? The gang wouldn't say. I knew they didn't trust me. What I needed was an act of kinship. Something that would show that I had genuine street cred. I went for broke. Do you like that? How did you learn to do that, you? A wet car park in Kent. Do you like that? Do you yeah, like it? Yeah. Shall I do a Jason? I'll do a Jason. I'll do a Jason. It's a 180 in reverse. It was one of the sickest handbrake turns I'd ever pulled off in a hot hatch. They agreed to share their experiences with me. So, Jack, it must be pretty tough growing up in the inner city as a young person, is it? Yeah, it is. I was using a technique called speak ball. Can you elaborate? Basically. Uh, you can only speak when you're holding the speak ball. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you? What was the question? Do you? Yeah, right. Do you understand that you can only speak when you're holding a basketball? Yeah. It's called the speak ball. Speak ball is an American counselling technique I'd used on my own son when he went through a phase of throwing chairs at his teacher, to which I later bought the global rights in perpetuity. It was also something I'd incorporated into Forward Solutions, the life coaching programme devised in the 90s for weak people and dysfunctional sales teams. Where are you going? The genius of the idea lies in its combination of order and fun. Speakball, an Alan Partridge brand. Thanks a lot, guys. Well done. Well, we're getting on great now, and I think the Alan Partridge Speakball system has demonstrated itself as an innovative and effective, effective, way, to, effective way to connect.
and shows that, um, and that if you give these lads a chance, they will open up. Despite suffering a badly squashed ear, I was actually delighted they'd thrown the bee ball at me. It was exactly the kind of friendly hijinks that proved I was now on the inside. I was even allowed to join their smoking circle. Where's Baz? That is grand. It is, right? A gangland house party and proof I'd been accepted as one of their own. This was nevertheless a tinderbox of underage booze, suspicious glances and fear of outsiders. But I managed to blend in by stooping slightly and saying all right instead of hello. This is an ecstasy pellet. The guys here tell me these change hands for £120 each, although they sold me this one at a mate's rate of just 70 it's chilling to think how easily these can fall into the wrong hands. Not to mention a teenage tummy. I'll be disposing of this on my next toilet visit. Because so-called recreational drugs have blighted the lives of junky teenagers for years, from Alad Jones to Zamo to my assistant's nephew, Tim Benfield. And so dispose of it I did, but not before checking it was legit by nibbling a corner off like television detectives do. And whilst this did give me a mild high during which I felt a bit hot and couldn't stop talking about Lewis Hamilton, it was nothing I couldn't handle, and I've no regrets about nibbling it whatsoever. Where are we going now? In actual fact, I enjoyed a perfectly pleasant evening, meeting new friends, chatting amiably, and I was still on the dance floor at 8 o'clock the next morning. At 10 o'clock, I had a meeting with the mayor, which gave me just enough time for a sink wash and an egg baguette, after which I was back to my old self and ready to get some answers. What do you think, sorry, do you think there's a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots? Well, life for the poorest sections of society is incredibly tough. Um, the challenge for us as a council is to tackle these problems at a time when our budgets have been cut by central government and we're unable to raise council tax. <clears throat> um, and, uh... What can you tell me about your plan to boost inward investment in the area? Well, our main aim for Manchester in the next few years is the economy. Stupid. That's a Bill Clinton quote, by the way. I didn't mean you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, we believe that over the next five years we can bring in over 500 million of inward investment to the area. Right, which I think I'm right in saying will make Manchester the leading recipient of inward investment of any major city in the G8. Lady Mayor, thank you for speaking to me. It's my pleasure. Ha! Huh. Mmm. I'm so cold. <sighs> Alan Partridge says that I'll... I'd enjoyed sparring with the Lady Lord Mayor, despite having a minor cold, but it was time to move on and tackle another of the challenges facing underprivileged people in Britain today. We've all got our favourite kind of bank. High street, investment, sand and sperm. But who's heard of a food bank? What's a food bank? Well, it's free food for poor people. And while the idea of getting free food sounds superb, we only have to think back to how we all picked on the boy who got free school dinners to realise it's more complicated than that. Because for the people on the receiving end, it can be a demeaning experience. But what if there was another way? Joel Maidment is what is known as a freegan. And while that may sound like a type of Irishman, it's actually a term for someone who finds and eats food thrown away by supermarkets. Now, when most people picture the kind of person who rummages through bins for food, they imagine a certain type, someone who's fallen through the cracks in society. And yet, this is not the kitchen of a tramp. <laughs> this is rather lovely. Thank you. <laughs> and whilst nothing in here is brand new, that's also sort of part of your philosophy, isn't it? I noticed when I came in, for example, your TV is fairly old, quite small. Oh, well, we don't have to watch much TV. Yeah, I sometimes say that. Point is, you're comfortably off. Yes, um, I guess. My wife's a lecturer. <laughs> are they all? Um, but you are a freegan. You scavenge for free food. Correct. Um, yeah, freegans try and live off what other people throw away. It's an ethical decision to prevent waste. So you make good use of the things that you find, the things that uh, we everyday folk leave behind. You're a womble. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> in Britain we throw away six million tonnes of food every year. 
um, and, and much of it is in very good condition. So I think as a society, we should feel ashamed of that. I'm just as guilty. I'm just, I, uh, there's a burger van on the A47. I always order the half pounder. Um, but do I get through the second patty? No. no. I just, yeah, fisted into a discarded coffee beaker and pop it in a canal. Well, I think... Um, so uh, you uh, would eat anything within reason? Within reason, yeah. For example, an egg mayonnaise sandwich still in its wrapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's still in its wrapping, I'll eat that. Okay, uh, a plastic bottle of iron brew, but the top's been chewed. Yes. By a rat. Uh, if the seal hasn't been broken, I would drink that. An egg in a sock. Yes, I mean, if, if food looks good, it generally is good. Okay, an egg still in its shell, looks fine, mm -hmm. but it's from the 90s. Um, well, maybe. Uh, a condom full of grapes. Yes. You need to sort yourself out, mate. Well, it's one of the coldest nights of the year, and I'm about to go on a scavenge with Joel. I'm wearing a head-mounted GoPro camera, exactly the same sort worn by US Navy SEALs when they assassinated Osama bin Laden. And I'm hoping to find a bin laden with food. Let's freegan! This skip here is just jam-packed with food. Right. Mm. Yeah. So it's like a garage full of food, isn't it? Yeah. That reminds me of Moira Stewart's garage. Uh, uh, hers was full of snacks during a low point in her life. She survived for a year on Quavers, Cheetos and Pringles. Really? Yeah, she's got scurvy. Actually, she told me that in confidence. So. Oh, I won't say anything. So, yeah, get that ladder there, go up there, and you can get into... Uh, I mean, it's basically self-sufficiency, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's like they say, give a man fish, he eats for a day, give him a fishing rod. Yeah, he'll probably come back the next day saying, you know, that fishing rod you gave me, go on, can I have another? <sighs> what happened to the one I gave you? Oh, I sold it. Let me guess, to buy some skag. No, to buy some fish. I was hungry. Did it not occur to you that you could have used the fishing rod to catch some fish? Oh, I haven't got a permit and I don't know how to get one. Google it! When did this happen? Hmm? Oh, it didn't. It's just a generic, annoying man who lives inside my, my mind. A head squatter. I don't mean a dominatrix. I mean... Shit! Wait, wait, where are you going? I thought we were allowed. I think uh, the noise that you can hear out there was a security guard. Whilst technically we weren't breaking the law by being out there, security guards tend to have a bit of a chip on the shoulder and no qualifications, and that's quite a combination. Oh my God, I think I can hear them locking the doors. <laughs> Shit. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on, hello? Come on, please. As I pummel the shutter, I catch sight of a figure through a crack in the corrugated door. I can see someone out there. Hello? Man? He's not responding. Chav! I'm deliberately trying to rile him, get him to respond that way. Chav, man! Fat boy! You stop just standing there! I was later to discover that the figure I'd seen was nothing more than a cardboard cutout of a Nolan sister holding some Activia. I report you! I am trapped. A long part says that I'll... I'm locked in a warehouse because a man who goes on about ethics deserted me to save himself. Funny old world. He could find a banquet in a bin bag, but couldn't find real balls in his own ball bag. It was now three hours since my last meal, and while Joel the Freegan was probably tucking into chicken soup, chicken pie and lily-livered pate, the man was a coward, I was becoming dangerously hungry. Now, normally I, I carry a Snickers bar concealed in my bicep pocket. Some people think that water is more important. Wrong. Uh, Bear Grylls, Christian Hardman told me that you can always drink your own urine, um, but when you're hungry, you, you, you want to eat a Snickers. Unfortunately, my bad assistant has washed the fleece without checking for contents, and the pocket now contains a flaky chocolate brick and handfuls of nut dust. Then a brainwave. Special forces are trained to think outside of the box. If I could get some of this food outside of the box, or its box, I could survive. 
I struck gold with what I can only describe as a cross-section of an egg and ham slice. I can only describe as a kind of a, a cat scan of a square scotch egg. And I know that if I eat two of those and uh, four wagon wheels... Looking back, I can see that the GoPro's fisheye lens has made me look grotesque. Put this image on my Tinder profile and it will be a barren few months indeed. This is the picture I use on Tinder. Being here is unsettling. I am gripped by a lonely introspection, like Andrew Neil on the train or an elephant at Chester Zoo. In the 80s, I once climbed onto the roof of a bus shelter to rescue a cuddly lion I'd won for Carol at a fun fair. Uh, some boys had thrown it up there. Uh, this is when I was still married to her. Yeah. Felt like I could do anything when I was married to Carol. But danger is looming, because like Carol, the warehouse had grown incredibly cold and unloving. Absolutely freezing in here. I've not been this cold since uh, I had to dial 999 after the ice bucket challenge. I begin to panic, running up and down in a futile attempt to keep warm. My extremities are now stinging. Unless I find a way to warm up soon, I'll be dead by morning. Just another one of the ghosts that haunts the aisles and corridors of this facility like the one I witnessed when watching back CCTV footage from the warehouse cameras. What was this glowing figure, this strange spectral form? It took me a full ten seconds before I remembered that it was me. In my desperation to keep warm, I'd used packing material and box tape to fashion what most people would describe as a classic bubble wrap double gown and cowl. Well, I'm warm as toast. Unfortunately, I look like the bastard love child of a bubble-wrapped honey monster and some sort of demented Scottish widow. Uh, horrific thought, the honey monster forcing himself on a Scottish widow. And she's been through enough. The lovely bubbly warmth is just the fillip I need in the minutes before the warehouse is due to open. Unfortunately, it turns out the warehouse is closed at weekends and it is to be another 51 hours before I am discovered by which time my mental state has become fragile. What are you doing? I'm not a weird thing. Stop. Cease fire! Cease fire! It's the bubble wrap! Cease fire! Hold your fire! It's the noise of the bubble wrap! Oh, yeah. What have you done with your fucking clothes? We're folded up over there. A long part says a dial. I genuinely feel I've emerged a changed man and one who's undergone a conversion every bit as dramatic as St Paul on the road to Damascus and a good deal safer. Try to convert to Christianity on the roads of uh, modern day Syria and you'd be bundled into a car by the bad bastards of ISIS, forced to read a prepared statement on YouTube and then beheaded by a ten year old. Unspeakable man. And a horrible boy. It was time for me to become a better man starting with an apology I should have made some time ago to the very person who'd started me off on this journey, the chap I'd so grossly offended, Marvin. It was time to make amends. So I've prepared a statement that I will be reading to... Marvin. Marvin, uh, to make sure that the apology is unequivocal, ensure that that happens. I, Alan Partridge of Sound Mind, do humbly state that I'm sorry if you felt offended uh, all were offended. Uh, I was under a lot of pressure at the time because the woman I loved had decided she no longer felt similarly towards me. Nevertheless, I was wrong to imply that you have feelings for sheep, or if you do, that you give physical expression to those feelings through ovine congress. Uh, I also regret shoving you in the car park, that was another thing that happened, uh, and calling you a chav, a horrible pejorative term that should be consigned to the museum of no longer acceptable words like strumpet, nancy boy, or packy. Packy or chinky? Packy. Thank you. Uh, I apologise unreservedly. Equally, I'm sure there are a number of things about that day that you'd like to reflect on too. At that point, as a peace offering, I'll offer to take him to Chapelfield Shopping Centre for a fizzy drink and a sandwich. Do kids still drink sandwiches? Uh, eat fizzy drinks? Well...
Well, unfortunately, Marvin was a no-show, uh, which is a shame, but I wanted to have my say, so I texted him my statement slash apology, and he has responded with an emoji of a sheep. And if you can see that there. Um, hard to know what that means. If it's a humorous comment, fine. If it's a rehashing of his original sheep-shagging comment, then I shan't dignify it with a response. Uh, in much the same way that David Cameron deftly swatted away those rather scurrilous rumours. I don't know if you remember there was a suggestion that David put his cock in a pig's mouth, which in any case should be seen in the context of his many great achievements, uh, such as tax breaks for big business. One in the eye for the tax man. Um, although there's no suggestion that he, he put it there. Well, I may not be able to set the record straight with Marvin, but just because one disadvantaged teenager wanted to act the prick, it didn't mean I couldn't reach out to others. And I knew exactly who to call. Their names were Gavin, Mark, Riley, Darren, and another Gavin. Come on, lads. Darren, put your high vis on, mate. It's the adventure scouts, man. I know, but it's, it's insurance reasons. Come on. Why do you want me looking like a melon photo? I've been through this. Yes, in their own sullen way. I sensed that these boys had never felt more alive. Who's for a swig of Bovril? What's that? Bovril? Basically, beef tea. <sighs> Do you like hot salt drinks? We stomped up hills and scrambled across scree, and the only brain-altering highs they were allowed this time were the kind of geological facts that would give them flashbacks for the rest of their lives. Those rock formations up there were formed from the fossilised shells of uh, dead sea creatures. So if you think about it, the entire Peak District is one enormous scampy graveyard. <laughs> Pretty cool, yeah? Come on, let's take a closer look. I don't believe in reincarnation, but if I have had a previous life, it would probably be as one of Britain's leading geography teachers. If you'd have suggested that after making this documentary, my life would have been put into perspective by five teenagers from Manchester, I would have pushed you into some bushes. And yet here we are. Because while these lads weren't going to win any awards for Greek or Latin, they'd get an A-plus if there was a B-Tech in fun. And as I hurtled through the air, feeling calm and relaxed, I found myself looking back on what had been by any measure an incredible journey. And whilst you're not going to convince everyone, it was clear I'd achieved genuine redemption. I was cleansed, absolved, perhaps even at peace. Could this be the time to sink back into the deep, dark depths of obscurity, to bow out gracefully? Or maybe, just maybe, the time to emerge renewed, reborn, resurrected. Not just a better man, but a better, more sought-after broadcaster. A woman I know who's a Baptist wept when she saw these pictures, as I suspect many of you are now. All that remains is for me to bid you a fond farewell. For I must go now, back to my flock, certain to be welcomed with open arms by listeners, YouTube commentators and sponsors alike. Goodbye, or should I say, au revoir. Goodbye. Get in, 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 get in,